Hello and welcome. Welcome to the McLean Holiday Arts and Crafts Festival for the year 2000. Since 1982, this juried event has been a treasure in McLean. And three cheers for the McLean Community Center's leadership, for George Sachs, for Catherine Nesbitt, and for Fairfax County for making it continue. It's a, been a different year, 2020, and it's an opportunity to demonstrate the resilience and the community, the creativity and the problem solving that comes with being an artist and being an art lover. It is a treasure for us all to be together today. You'll have the opportunity to see artists in their studios, to have questions with them one-on-one, -on -one, and to learn more about many of the artists who are gonna be presenting in this show today and tomorrow. We encourage you to ask questions. We encourage you to go check out the McLean Center website to find ways that you can interact with these artists directly and visit their stores. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you and the opportunity to spend time with these artists. I firstly would like to introduce Emily Pizzulich. Emily is the chair of this year's event, past chair of the Northern Virginia Handcrafters Guild, and has an awful lot to share about the history of the event and what this means to artists. Emily? Thank you, Lori. Um, and welcome everyone to our show. Um, I, I'm delighted that you all are able to be here. And I wanna give a shout out to all the artists who applied to the show and who've worked so hard on their crafts. This, this is a great show for all of you. Um, we have so many different product categories. We have basketry, we have glasswork, we have woodwork, we have uh, jewelry, we have uh, all the traditional favorites. And there are all kinds of things that will, um, that, that, that you can buy for any budget and, you know, and any style of thing that you'd like. Um, our artists come from all over. We have people from Philadelphia, from further south, um, and they're bringing new and different things that you may or may not seen before. We've had some of your favorite artists here, but we also have some brand new ones. So I think you'll really be interested in going uh, to the McLean website and clicking on each of the artists' links and finding out all that they have to offer. Um, again, thank you for coming today, and let me give you back to Lori. It is uh, really a, a work of art in itself, the videos that these artists have put together. Hello, I'm Chris, the photographer, and behind the video camera is my partner in life and the arts, Kathy. And together we produce macrofine photography, artistic nature photography. What intrigues and inspires me is my love of nature the individual component parts that make up the whole grand scheme are what really capture my attention. To me, these little parts are where nature really gets to shine. Whether that's in dewdrops on new grass, a tiny frog in a plumeria leaf, or the intricacies of minerals, or bark, or ice. These are the important parts of nature. I've been photographing nature most of my life, and my mind's eye has always gone to these smaller elements. And in order to capture these, I'll use macro lenses mostly. I use a 50 millimeter lens and a 60 millimeter lens for the most part. I will occasionally also use a telephoto, but even at that, my subjects are only a few feet away. Most of my work is arm's length. Some of it, though, it's down to like an inch or two away from the subject. The last few months have offered us a lot of opportunity to work indoors, creating studio setups. We've been working on a series we call Mindscapes. These are arrangements which take the viewer's mind and senses on a nature journey without ever leaving home. We'll take a variety of flowers, some bought, some from our yard, along with a variety of other natural components arrange them, create them flat in trays, and then photograph those and print them on aluminum as we do all of our work. We like the brilliance and the depth and clarity and vibrance that aluminum affords. We'll then finish the back with a frame. This gives the piece structure, allows you to hang it, and because it's three quarters of an inch thick, when you put it on the wall, you get a dramatic floating effect to your piece. Plus, aluminum is durable, humidity proof, and easy care. Another way that we create unique pieces is with sculpturing. 
Sometimes we'll take an image, we'll subdivide it electronically and physically. We'll sublimate each of the component images separately and assemble them into one unit. We call these aluminum photographic wall sculptures. With this piece, for example, we've got five separate panels and we've used two lighting scenarios combined to produce one dramatic piece. When we build these wall sculptures, our component parts are all on different layers. When this, these pieces are hanging, as the lighting and your viewing angle changes throughout the day, you get an ever-changing array of shadows and reflections and highlights throughout the entire piece. Thank you for watching. Visit our website at macrofinephotography.com to see all of our beautiful imagery. Also, be sure to look at our behind the scenes pages to learn more about how we make our aluminum photographic wall sculptures. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bobby. I'd like to take a couple minutes to introduce you to my business, Betty Jane's Sweet Delights. The business is actually named in honor of my mom. We used to make peanut butter when I was a kid growing up and gave it away as gifts. So as an adult, I turned it into a business and I've shared it for over 13 years in Northern Virginia with many of you and hopefully many new customers throughout the fall holiday season. Before I get started, I'd like to say my husband John and I miss you for the existing customers that we've had or people that we've seen you know, throughout the years in our booth. It's been a tough year. We hope you're well. We hope you have a wonderful fall and holiday season and make the best of it. And we look forward to seeing you in 2021. To reintroduce you to the peanut brittle, we have four sizes. We do a one, four, eight, and 12 ounce. As a reminder, it's all uh, made and packaged for gift giving. We put bows on every package. We put gift tags on every package. There's a front and back label. We do change the bows with the holiday seasons and through the seasons throughout the year. Occasionally, uh, customers do request a, sp a specific bow color for an event um, that they have going on. So all you have to do is just let's have that conversation to see if I even have the bow in stock. So I'd like to show you the sizes. This is my one ounce size. It actually makes a great party favor, stocking stuffer, wedding favor. I realize there's not a lot of partying going on right now. It also makes a great single serving. Throughout the fall and holiday season, I do offer it in packages of five. And again, it's the same purpose, single serving uh, party favors or stocking stuffers. Uh, people tend to put it at their table also throughout the holiday or fall season. And again, we can change that bow color if you need be. The other three sizes are my four ounce. Again, they're all packaged, heat sealed, the labels, the bows um, on every package. This one tends to be used quite frequently um, for weddings and small party favors or also put into small baskets. I also have the eight ounce, which is, can be given as a gift unto itself or put with a box of chocolates or um, a bottle of wine or even sometimes I've seen people put jewelry with it just a little trinket of jewelry or something like that and then the largest size is the 12 ounce size it's perfectly fine as a gift by itself but again it's all what you're looking to do occasionally people will add uh, chocolate or wine to it as well for the local customer uh, we do local deliveries within five to seven miles from our home you can just call us at 703-343-0160 to arrange that. Uh, it's just a small fee and we'd have to coordinate a schedule. For our online orders, we do ship with FedEx and UPS. We just encourage you to plan accordingly because we have received emails from them that they occasionally are experiencing delays due to COVID. And once the peanut brittle leaves our facility, we have no control over the UPS or FedEx um, chain of delivery. So we just ask you to plan accordingly. Oh, and the one thing I forgot to add too is if you have a need for a gift message, we can add it for a birthday or for the holiday season. And we also can um, uh, put special tissue um, around the packages as well. So the website is uh, BettyJanesSweetDelights.com just like you see here, but take the apostrophe out. 
And again, feel free to give us a call. We miss you. We hope you have a happy fall and a happy holiday season and look forward to 2021. Anjali Sundaram from Sovereign Treasures. I do gift articles in glass and ceramic paint. Most of my glass starts like completely clear like this. I color the glass in an assortment of colors and then do the patterns on them. These are freehand designs inspired by Indian henna patterns. Occasionally I work with colored glass in which case the design is directly done onto the glass. Sometimes my patterns are simple and sometimes they can be a little more elaborate. All the glass is then fired so that it is safe for indoor as well as outdoor use. It can be used to coordinate with your taste, your decor, your budget, or the occasion. I'll be happy to walk you through my display. So here is my display. As you can see, there are a wide variety of items beginning at this end. We have the bowls in various sizes. No two pieces are ever alike and my colors are very strong and vibrant. They've often been referred to as jelly bean colors. These are glasses which could be used as a votive or as a pen stand for makeup brushes, some more bowls. Um, a, a huge customer favorite are these small tilted bowls. They come in a variety of colors. I started them as votives but women like them for jewelry, salt, olive oil. Men like them for paper clips, rubber bands, keys, spare change. Perhaps one of my most versatile pieces. Uh, some milk bottles and vases at the back. I have my trivets. You can put them, you can put hot food on them. They're lined at the back so it doesn't scratch your table surface. And no two pieces are ever alike. There's different colors to suit every taste. Um, here's one which has been extremely popular. I just finished a customized order for a mum to be. These were part of the favors given for her baby shower. Um, as I said, lots of options to choose from. If you don't see something in a color you like, I can always do it for you. I can be contacted at sovereigntreasures at gmail.com. My Facebook and Instagram handle is Sovereign Treasures. My number is 703-380-6648. Please do give me a shout if there's something you like. I'll be happy to uh, cater the item to your individual taste and requirement. I look forward to hearing from you in the near future. Stay safe. Hello, welcome to my studio. I'm Rajan Patili. I'm a jewelry artist and I work mainly with sterling silver. I'm really fascinated with texture, so sterling silver is a perfect medium for me. Today, I'm going to show you 
how I can achieve a wide array of textures using different tools. A rolling mill, which lets me transfer a pattern onto a silver sheet. A number of hammers, each of them having a specific and different head. And the most fun of all the tools, fire. First, a classic, a ball pin hammer. The rounded head is used to move or texture metal by creating large overlapping dimples. This sterling silver cuff was forged and textured with a ball pin hammer, after which I added silver granules and a dark patina. Then we have an embossing hammer. Its purpose is to create small, shallow, decorative dimples that do not move the middle as much as the ball pin hammer. Using the embossing hammer on these earrings, I created multiple facets that increase light reflection and brightness. I used the flat, sharp heads of this hammer to create line patterns that can be parallel, crisscrossing, or random. On this brass and silver pendant, I created parallel lines around the edges at the front and random lines all over the back. Finally, here's a specialty hammer called raw silk hammer. It creates a very soft and organic texture that looks a little like fabric. Even on small post earrings like this, this texture, enhanced with a touch of dark patina, brings a lot of interest. Now let's play with fire. Fusion is a tricky technique where we have to bring our silver very close to melting point without actually melting it. Only the surface of the metal gently bubbles and it can be dragged along by the flame of the torch. Like lava, the metal surface changes from nice and smooth to a grainy and organic texture upon cooling. Combining a couple of these fused silver circles is a very simple but effective way to get funky and unique earrings. Another great way to create texture is to fuse silver dust on top of another piece of silver. Upon reaching melting point, the silver dust bonds to the middle underneath resulting in a fine grainy texture. The grainy texture we get from fused silver dust 
provides a great contrasting background to smooth shiny elements and stones. A rolling mill is a great tool to transfer texture from a template to a piece of mill. One option is to use commercially available template plates. The resulting piece can then be cut, shaped and decorated like a regular piece of wood. A second option is to use one-time templates such as dry leaves or twisted copper wire. The patterns often that way are unique and from there on the only limit is your imagination. I would like to congratulate each of those artists who gave you such a fantastic tour of their video and their processes. One of the things that's true about 2020 is we've all had to figure out how to do different parts of our jobs in different ways. I hadn't spent much time on, on camera uh, in my role, but I am getting there, a little bit awkward still, but I hope you'll go with me. And I would like to take this chance to again, congratulate each of them and thank them. I really enjoyed learning about their processes. It's a treat now to have time with four artists we're gonna have a conversation among several of us. So if I could ask Anjali, Rajan, Rona, and Bobby to come on screen. So I have had a lot of fun on each of your websites and with each of your videos. And I have many questions for all of you, but one of them is the concept. Hi, Rona, nice to see you. One of them is the concept that there's no such thing as a part-time artist, right? It's not as if you walk into your studio and you're an artist and you walk back out and you're a spouse or a parent or a, or a, professional, a working professional in other ways. You're always an artist. And the problem solving that uh, being an artist infuses in the rest of your lives. And so the questions that I have uh, for each of you is, you know, how, how do they interact? And how, do, how for example, Rona, I'd love to know you are, you are distinctive in how you have built your career. I've seen you in many places, and I will confess I'm wearing one of your rings today. I, how have you built your career? I think one of the things that's a treat about communities like this is to learn from each other. And I have seen your website, your time management. Share a little bit about how you've built your career, would you? I started out as a fine arts painter and just wanting to not do odd jobs and, and do work I didn't want to do and split my time between being an artist and kind of earning a living. I thought, well, I need to do something else and let's try out a whole lot of different things, uh, printmaking, um, jewelry, glass cutting and stained glass windows. And through all these little pieces of glass, I thought, well, I could make little earrings out of them. And, sell them and see how that goes. And that was fun. And then I got all obsessed on making all these little intricate parts. And I thought, well, I'm going to try doing this in sterling silver and see what happens. And then I was just hooked after that. And that was it. Isn't that great? And you've been doing shows pretty right full time for how long? Remember, yeah. Yeah. I started out uh, in Germany and found little day shows to do. And uh, the craftsmen and artisans there would go to flea markets and sell their work. That's kind okay. of the only option um, because of their system. So, and how many years have you been coming to McLean? <laughs> five or six, maybe. All right. Well, five great. Or six. Uh -huh. well, lovely to see you. And when I look at your jewelry, and then I and I look at Rajan's website, I'm intrigued how 
work, both working in metals, you can have such different incarnations. And what I'll share with you on this hand, Rajan, is a hammered silver band that my son made when he was in seventh grade. Ooh. And so I, I but, <laughs> but so it's very meaningful to me to see your process. And I appreciated how in your video, you were very specific in showing us your process. How is it that with the pieces being so different one from another, what, what, what's your inspiration? How do you choose? Are, are you on a, are you on a nature theme? Are you on to what, what, how do you move between the various different categories and themes of your work? Uh, well, you're asking Rona or? Uh -huh. Well, I could tell you, well, to me, the inspiration part is a little fuzzy because uh, my background is actually, I mean, I just ended up making jewelry by accident. I started uh, I took my first class six years ago. I was recovering from an aneurysm and I had spent months without being able to speak or move my fingers. And whenever you have a brain injury, the idea to heal and speed up the healing is to learn new things. Mm -hmm. I just took this class by chance. I fell in love. It helped me recovering the use of my fingers. It also helped healing the uh, psychological effects um, of the aneurysm. And um, my inspiration is still mainly based on my feelings, the healing process, the hardship associated to that. And in general, the, the struggles we go through, through life, and also the joys. But to me, that, that's something that's really deep from very deep inside myself. And I cannot really identify specific uh, subjects of inspiration. It's just a big melting pot of my life, my life experiences. So the healing art concept is kind of a, a one in the same redundant statement, isn't it? Where through making your art, it was a healing process. Have you found that it's uh, continued either neurologically or physically to, to uh, help? Oh yeah, I, I still need it. It's and especially this year with COVID, uh, just messing up with our lives. <laughs> it also helped me grounding myself and still finding purpose and still keeping my fingers moving. And so it, it's a whole feeling well process that's ongoing. And honestly, I, I cannot see the end of it because it helps me and it it brings me happiness. And then it brings happiness to the people buying my pieces. Right. So there's no reason to stop, really. How wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And Anjali, and the idea that artists are always artists, whether they're in your studio or in the rest of your life, it, I'm imagining a based on your early introduction in your in your video that somebody special taught you henna. Uh, yes. So in First of all, I am an untrained artist. I just learned on the, you know, as I went along. Uh, I did do a henna application course years ago. And um, when I started painting on glass, it was a very gradual process. Along the way, I, I was quite influenced by the Art Nouveau movement. So the works of Clarius Cliff or Macintosh, Mark Rothko. And as I kept on working somewhere, I went back to my roots because I am from India. And uh, I took the Eastern concept in a Western mold. So it was a gradual process of evolution. Was henna something that you grew up with? Uh, yes, yes. Right. All our functions, all our religious festivals, henna does play an important part. My daughter is very much into henna now, and it's it's beautiful to see. And I like how it it there's both standard forms as well as watching her go free form. And yes. I feel like I see some of that in your art as well. Yeah. Now, what I'm intrigued by in watching your art is the brush that you must use in order to make that very very fine line. Can you describe that process a little? So I actually work with a small outliner tube. Once I've covered the, you know, painted the base color on the glass, I work with a small outliner tube, same principle as icing a cake. So when you touch the glass, it actually has a slightly embossed feel. Mm -hmm. So 
I, it's a small tune that I want. It's small tune, mm -hmm. but to keep it that fine and that consistent is taking a lot of practice. It, I grew better with age. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me if you goof up, can you undo it? Is there an erase or an, un, you know, control Z function? No, it's a very unforgiving medium because okay. don't forget the glass has a base color on it. So if I make a mistake and I wipe it off, the base color will come off. And if mm -hmm. I just touch it up, then you'll just see it as a dot. So I have to be careful. And I've had many a piece which I've had to wash and restart. So do you have many a pieces in your kitchen? Uh, no. Once, no. No, once I paint my glass, I sort of just dissociate myself from it. Otherwise, I wouldn't huh. really sell it. So once it's done, it's fired, I'm done. Well, let me ask, and before I get to you, Bobby, because I'm dying to hear about your your sweets, is that the same for you, Rona and Rajan? Do you do you wear your own jewelry, or once you do, you have to disassociate yourself from it in order to sell it? Um, once I make it, I'm also done with it. That's why I was laughing. It's the, <laughs> it's the doing, right? It's the doing of it uh, that is important. And, and then when you're finished, you say goodbye and go, you need to make room for the next piece. But there's there's a few pieces that I hang on to, of course. Yeah. Sure. And Rejan? Yeah, that's the same for me. There's this necklace here, which is one of the very first that I made. This I will always keep. I mean, I, there's probably about 15 people who try to buy it from me so far. And every time I have to say no, but that, that one is mine. <laughs> but everything else, yeah, that's the same thing. It's done. And, and then it's something, it's just like your babies. You have to let them go. So I just dissociate myself from them and they're met, meant for somebody else. They're not for me to keep. So I, I have an, my academic background is I was a religion major undergrad and I got my MBA, which are actually quite compatible in many ways, but I, one of my early religion professors said you need to, who, who was an Episcopal priest, uh, which was my background as well, and he said you need to divorce your faith from your study of religion, otherwise neither will survive. <laughs> and it sounds to me like you could either be laden in your own jewelry <laughs> and not have a business, or you can say, no, I'm going to hold on to this one and uh, sell. That makes sense, but I'd never thought about it in the context of art. And with you talking about uh, selling, I will take this minute to remind everybody to go to mclanecenter.org. There's under special events, there is a very big, wonderful feature that you can click through and get to all of these, all of these websites. They're grouped uh, by medium, and it's a really easy transaction. I am so excited, Betty, to learn about your process and particularly about this question of an artist is always an artist. But is it in your kitchen? And does that mean you always feel like you're bound there? Or have you figured a way to kind of seg segment a part of your life such that you can, it's not invasive in, in everything you do? I actually eat my product. <laughs> so <laughs> I am married to it. Um, so yeah, so we, um, I actually am licensed and inspected out of my home. So mm -hmm. the challenge with that, it, it's um, making peanut brittle is very labor intensive. And one pot is only about 60 ounces and not this year, but historically I do about two to three ton a year and I make that all myself. So when you think about 60 ounces in a batch, um, it's very labor intensive. So what has to happen in my house is- um, Can you stop for a second and help me on the math? 60, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> how many tons divided by 60 ounces? How many batches are you making? In I, I make um, probably about two, wait, I can't even do the math right now. I make about- it sounds like about 4,000 batches. batches. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But this year is extremely different, obviously, because of right. you know, everything that's going on. But it's still a um, an assembly line kind of mentality because you, you, I literally have to clean my entire kitchen and prep it before I'm allowed to actually start processing it. So what I've done and um, tweaked over the years is just basically a process, a mentality, like you start at a certain hour and you just, you make it until you're done. And then the, the unfortunate part is it's not just making it, it's breaking it, bagging it, sealing right. it, bowing it. So there's a, there's a long, they're usually really long days. Um, 
the, the one thing I'll say though, is because um, it is the kitchen we also use and there's a lot of restrictions in it because of the way the Department of Health and Department of Agriculture are. Um, you can't, I can't be eating, I can't be cooking. So at the end of the day, the last thing I wanna do is actually go back in the kitchen and cook and dinner. Cook, right? <laughs> so we eat a lot of leftovers, so. I bet, but. I bet. Well, Thanksgiving week's good for that. Yes. <laughs> so you mentioned it was your mom's recipe. Is that where it started? Yeah, so we, I am one of seven children that were all born in the 50s and 60s. And that was back in a time period where a lot of people, that's what you, at least where I grew up, everybody got handmade, handcrafted gifts. And my mom was um, an amazing person and very talented. Um, she worked for my dad, but she also taught herself how to sew and do a lot of other things. And one of the, what we used to do was give home baked goods for gifts. And the peanut brittle was something that, um, she found a recipe and tweaked. So um, I grew up making it. It's one of the few talents I got off of her. And then for me personally, I, um, I had a career in healthcare. And um, at some point in my life, I woke up and said, I was done working for corporate America and decided to launch this business. And we are currently 13 years old. So we've survived um, a couple of downturns at this point. Wow, well done. And, and you did you mention also that your husband is a partner with you in the business? Well, we co-own it, <laughs> but, but I, I laugh because- He runs for takeout it. while you're making the peanut brittle. Is yeah, that the way that works? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so my, my funny part about that is yeah, we do co-own it, but he, he works for Corporate America still. So a lot okay. of times on weekends, That's a good you'll, balance. you'll see, see him imagine. out there. What's, what's funny to me a lot of times is I'm usually the one who's out selling it at shows but people will walk up to me and say well where's the guy who always sells it they don't remember me but they remember him so that's, that's kind funny. of my my humor in all of it that is good humor and do you find you sell it largely in uh in a direct to consumer that way or do you have any corporate clients i i have a little bit of both. Um, the corporate client world kind of is, um, ebbs and flows because it's all about the relationship. So if you sure. have a relationship with a certain executive chef and that person quits or moves across the country, you kind of end up losing that relationship. But at this point in time, 90% uh, of my sales is direct consumer um, sales. And particularly this time of year between shipping and local deliveries, um, it's a pretty busy time which is good. Right. Yeah, that is very good. That is very good. And again, I'd like to commend the McLean Community Center and Catherine Nesbitt for driving on, right? In 2020, for all of us who love art, it's really a treasure to know that this was going to be here. And actually, the silver lining of this is the chance to speak with each of you this way. When I've walked through the, when I walked, walked through the McLean Art and Craft Show, there's not quite this much of a time for dialogue, is there? Well, a couple questions have come up that I'm really enjoying seeing. One of them is, Anjali, would you please comment more about how you maintain food safety with your glass? And, and I'd actually love to know about fragility too. The dishwasher concept was there, but. Well, my glass is hand wash only. The paint okay. do specify that you can use the top shelf of the dishwasher, but I always tell my customers to wash them by hand. It's like fine china. So if you sure. treat it with respect, it'll last a long time. Um, the paint is done on the outside of the glass, so it never comes in contact with the food. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. Well, you all are, are, are inspiring individually and collectively a great set of colleagues. I would love to invite you to take the last couple minutes that we have to, to share any observations of the other's work. I think it's just wonderful seeing the variety of art and craft. And I personally feel there's so much to learn. It keeps me grounded. I'm mm -hmm. never going to have a soul in head because there are such wonderful artists around. So I think that's fantastic. That's great. Well, this has been really lovely to spend time with each of you. Thank you so much. And I will now share with our audience that we're going to be moving on to our second set of videos to learning about another group of artists. Hi, my name is Barry Hash, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 McLean Virtual Arts and Crafts Festival. This is our first year doing uh, virtual, and this is my first time doing a virtual show. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. Tell you a little bit about myself. I'm originally from West Virginia. I uh, grew up in a small coal mining community, 
And I first learned about ceramics from uh, several folks that worked at the uh, Community Craft Center and wound up teaching ceramics there at the Craft Center, helping out with the kids class on Saturday mornings, and later on went on to uh, Camp Thomas E. Lightfoot, which was the uh, uh, coal company's camp for their children that they would send them to once every couple of weeks. So I learned ceramics there. I'm also a juried member of the Northern Virginia Handcrafters Guild. I've done private shows and public shows. I've done work on commission. And I wanna show you some of the things that I've done. This is by no means all the things that I've done, but I had to pick several things for the video and I hope you enjoy them. This is a poinsettia tree Christmas tree. And what's neat about this is it's done with clear glaze, under glaze, and mother of pearl overlay. And then the gold balls are fired gold balls. Another mother of pearl tree is the small white tree here. And like I say, it's a mother of pearl tree. And both of the trees, well, all of the trees have a central light. So the, uh, the individual bulbs are glued in holes were made, glued in, and then uh, the central light supports them. Uh, some of the larger pieces will have music boxes when uh, the size of the piece lends itself to that. Some of the other things that I think you'll like, uh, a lot of people like gnomes. These gnomes come in different shapes, different sizes, you'll notice as we go through here. I have some others that I haven't finished yet, but um, they all have, or not all of them, but these have a gold band, and that's fire gold. The lights are individually attached, and this has what's called a clip light in the back. It just fits into the back of the piece like that, and then that provides the central light for the piece. Some of the other items also have lights. The small snowman here has lights, the tall snowman, now the tall snowman also has a music box. Um, I'm not going to try to play the music box because a lot of times you really can't hear it. It's kind of small, kind of soft, but you can hear it when the room is quiet. Here again, mother of pearl wreath with red cardinals and a red, big red bow. I also like lighthouses. Here's a sample lighthouse. Each lighthouse is wired individually. I have smaller ones than this, and I have a larger one that gets up to about, uh, I'm going to say 24 inches. It's a uh, sample or a replica of the uh, um, Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Some of the other things that you'll notice here, these are unique because it's um, glaze, and then over top of the glaze is silk screening. This is a new piece that I've been working on. It's um, just under glazes over top of a clear glaze, and it doesn't have to be refined. So it saves a little time, but it does take some extra time to do that. You'll notice a little teddy bear bank here. These are kind of cute, and they're part of what I call my calico collection. I have the teddy bear, and then I also have some cats, and uh, I think a little dog in the back but um, those are kind of nice. Something else that I really like are these stone candle holders here. They're antiqued and then the color is added and then they're glazed over top of that with a clear glaze. Now you notice the little tea lights in here. You can either use a tea light or there's a vial and in the vial you can put um, like lamp oil and it has its own wick and you can use real flames in that. Uh, you can also use real candles if you want, or artificial candles, or you could use the tea lights. It's your choice. Uh, some of the other things, here again, snowman, uh, the tall snowman here, this little snowman. The large Christmas tree is uh, something that's sort of a tradition in the ceramic community, I guess you could say. Uh, it probably dates back to the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s, when they first started making these, and a lot of people will pass them down to their um, children, grandchildren, 
and it becomes sort of a unique item that is a keepsake. So those are pretty uh, pretty nice. Another thing that I'd like to show you this is a this is a trivet, and the trivet actually is flat. But what I've done is I've transferred a design on here, and I've done something called sgraffito work. And sgraffito is where you carve around the piece, so it gives it sort of a 3D effect. Makes it stand out a little bit. The gnomes can, uh, like in this case, it can be a, um, a little candle holder or an incense burner in the back. These other items um, are all Christmas related, obviously. The, um, the teddy bear down here with the, well, it's not really a teddy bear, it's a snowman. Uh, it also has a uh, music box to it. And um, the one on the end also has a music box, the big snowman. But um, if you'd like to learn more, I have a storefront on Etsy. You can go www.etsy.com and you can uh, use their search bar to um, bring up BH Ceramics Inc. And it'll have a number of these pieces as well as some other pieces. And I plan to update that periodically throughout the year. So they'll be changing periodically. So I hope you've enjoyed the show, uh, enjoyed my video, and um, we'll take some time and see what other people have to offer here. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact me, bhceramicsinc at gmail.com. Thanks. Hi all, Andy Gallagher here. I'm showing you a selection of handmade glass bowls, dishes, whatever you want to call them. They are handmade by myself in a kiln that I have in my garage. They are all food safe and dishwasher safe, but I would recommend you hand washing as I can't guarantee that they will all survive the dishwasher. This is a selection of band saw trinket boxes made on the bandsaw selection of cutting boards made from bird's eye maple tiger maple and cherry this is a selection of christmas ornaments they'll be available these ones are available now but i'll have more available once this goes live and then some different shaped dishes. You are more than welcome to ask any questions. Thanks for looking. Hi, I'm Dave Jenkins, paper cutting artist, here in my Arlington studio. Now, some of you may be familiar with paper cutting traditions from around the world, 
Well, I follow my own tradition and create an eclectic mix of designs. I'm self-taught and have been selling my work at craft shows since 1999. Now let me show you how I do my work. For most of the pieces, I use this black paper. It's very black on one side, but white on the other, so I can draw my design in the back, on the back and cut from the back using an X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade. I then glue the finished piece to a contrasting background paper. Here's a piece I recently cut, for example. It's an elk, and I'll be gluing that to this piece of sky paper. Now let's take a look at some of my finished work. Over the years, I've cut out a number of alphabets organized around particular themes, such as kitchenware or transportation. Here's my mammal alphabet. As with all my work, you can see it's cut from a single piece of paper. Each of the alphabets, by the way, I include a key on the back identifying all the objects. And speaking of keys, here's a recent piece I've done with two dozen old keys, only one of which opens the heart-shaped lock. Now, if I'd like to add some color to my pieces, I sometimes include vintage postage stamps, such as this piece, Zoo Train, which has seven postage stamps from uh, around the world with various animals on them. Or I'll add other bits of vintage ephemera, such as this one with a metal sign from the 1940s. As you can see, these rocker birds have tapped the electric fence current. Some may find this piece shocking. And yes, I do use some puns in some of my work, such as my take on Hamlet, although this one is by Sir Francis Bacon. Or this other literary classic, Tequila Mockingbird. For the holidays, I've created a number of pieces, including this Hanukkah menorah, or this one of children decorating the Christmas tree. And I have done a number of small paper cuttings that I put into Christmas ornaments, as you can see, such as this one of a penguin. Now, over the years, I've also done a number of commissions, including for weddings or for new babies. If you'd like to talk to me about doing a commission, you can reach me through my website, davidjenkinspapercuttings.com, or you can check out my website to see many of the other paper cuttings I've done or to talk to me about purchasing one of them. Also follow me on Facebook to keep up with my current work. So thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you next year in person. Bye. Hi, I'm Brenda from Brenda's Bars, and I'd like to to welcome you to my virtual holiday shop. I make homemade soaps, whipped body butters, hand balms, and lip balms. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story. I'm a third generation soap maker. My mother and grandmother made soap. I grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and I used to watch my mother and grandmother make soap, but they wouldn't let me help because you can get burned by the lie. So I told my mom the best way to entice anybody to do something is to tell them they can't. So fast forward many years later, and now I'm making many, many bars of soap and actually very interesting and beautiful and crafty soap. I like to make my soaps with only good stuff, natural, all natural ingredients, no chemicals included. Some commercial bars use hardeners, preservatives, and stabilizers and fragrances in their bars. These chemicals can be absorbed into your skin. Your skin is your largest organ, so whatever you put on your skin does get is important because it does get absorbed into it. Some of the chemicals can be drying or irritating. I like to use high quality oils and butters that are nourishing and conditioning to your skin. I use olive oil, coconut oil, avocado, I use shea butter, cocoa butter, mango butter, and these things are nourishing to your skin and help prevent the dryness. I also use grass-fed milks, yogurts, and I like to use essential oils. Essential oils are naturally steam distilled from plants, so they give you the natural scent as opposed to fragrance oils, which are synthetically created, chemically created. Synthetic oils, fragrance oils, can last longer in soaps because of their nature, their chemical. Natural essential oils may fade, but usually they'll last at least around six months in your bar or soap. These high quality ingredients can be cleansing without being irritating to your skin. 
I make soap the old-fashioned way by mixing lye and water with what the oils as opposed to um, nowadays you can buy soap bases that are manufactured and made and all you have to do is melt and pour the soap base and pour it into a mold so um, I like to do things the old-fashioned way like my mother and my grandmother did it when you make soap with um, lye and, and oils it goes through a process called saponification and when it's a soap saponifies it creates glycerin in the soap and the glycerin is what makes the homemade soap so amazing. Glycerin is a humectant and it draws moisture out of the air into your skin. So the art of making soap is just like baking a cake. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. After you mix the oils and the, and the lyes together, you have to combine colors and execute the right techniques before the soap seizes. And that can be a challenge and that's part of a, the craft of creating beautiful soaps. My soap collection includes Three different kind of lines. I have Scents of the Season, they're in the top. This is Candy Cane, which is peppermint and vanilla. Deck the Halls is peppermint, spearmint, and orange. They're made with sweet almond oil, which is conditioning and moisturizing. It has high vitamin A, E, and B2, and soothes your dry skin. Next, there's Gift of the Magi, which is frankincense and myrrh, and Festivus, orange, pine tree, pine, and tea tree essential oils. They're made with shea butter, which has high fatty acids and is ideal for softening the skin. Midas Touch has cocoa butter. It's scented with lavender, patchouli, and sweet orange. It has a little bit of gold top. Um, it has the cocoa butter melts at body temperature, and it naturally soothes dry skin and can slow aging. Midas Touch also has avocado oil in it. The next two are made with yogurt. Yogurt Ripple and Crashing Waves. Crashing Waves tends to be quite popular, I think because of the lime, bergamot, bergamot and lemongrass scent. And these two both contain aloe juice, which are healing for your skin, as everyone knows. I have milk soaps, which are made with breast, breastfed um, yogurt, goat milk. This one is Lavender Swirls, it has lavender tea tree, it has sweet almond. Silky Hearts is really popular. It has little hearts on the top lavender spearmint and rosemary it has jojoba and shea butter and silk jojoba mimics the collagen in your skin and can improve the look of your skin rosebud and french green are both colored with natural clays and they have avocado oil cedar mountain is a nice sky soap because it has bergamot patchouli and cedar wood scents uh, it has sweet almond and jojoba and shea butter. And then I have what I call the Vibrant Color Work Collection, which is all the different colors and techniques that you can make to make the, the soap look beautiful. I want to highlight the new one this year. It's called Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope looks different on either side. It's scented with lavender and patchouli. Another one I would like to highlight is Springtime Colors. This one was made for a soap challenge. It's scented with lavender tea tree and spearmint. It has avocado, cocoa butter, and shea butter, so it's a double butter bar. I also have an unscented soap. The unscented soap has goat milk in it, and it has cocoa butter, avocado, jojoba, and aloe juice. It was made for specifically for a client who was having skin issues. I sell the soaps. You can get the soaps individually. They will come in a little organza bag. Or I have make your own gift boxes where you can buy two bars, select your only the two that two soaps that you like the most and put them in the box, or make your own three bar gift box. The gold boxes, I put in one of the four ounce body butters and a bar of soap, and these two you can make your own gift box. The difference between the body butters, I always get this question, body butters and hand bombs. The body butters are lighter because they're whipped. So they're really good to use after you take a shower you can lock in that moisture onto your skin and that will help your, st your skin stay young looking. The hand bombs are not whipped, so they're a little bit more like a cream that you would buy in a store. All right, I'd just like to thank you for watching my video. I hope you all have a healthy, happy holiday season. Um, and thank you for bearing with me first video. I actually teach classes online, but this is so much harder doing video. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, thanks so much for joining me and, and be well.
Hi, I'm Annika. I thought I'd show you some of my designs by sharing the storyboards behind them. These collections of images are the way I begin to create a dress. The boards then show the story behind the dress, as well as connect us to a time of year, a place, or maybe even a special occasion. At the end of each section is shopper's information. This includes special show pricing, as well as a holiday discount that's in effect until the 31st of December. You can buy my dresses at AnnikaBecker.com. If you're buying a gift for someone, or if you're buying for yourself, you may have questions. If so, don't hesitate to get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Again, I'm Lori Carboneau, and I am delighted to host this day together. You've just enjoyed some wonderful videos, and I would like to congratulate the artists. These are really terrific videos, and gosh, I uh, hope David would actually give some lessons. He's so smooth in that studio. I would like to introduce to you four artists for our second panel. They are Barry Hash, David Jenkins, Brenda Simon, and Joanne Straley Bast. Barry is the ceramicist we saw first, and David was the paper cutter. Brenda uh, has done all the wonderful soap works, and Joanne. Joanne, I would love to start with you insofar as we didn't have a chance today to see your video. Would you tell us a little bit about your art, please? Well, I work mainly in fiber of various kinds. Um, one thing I do is a machine embroidery where whoops, where I take my photographs, and a, a lot of my work is based on my photographs, print it on treated fabric. It's backed with paper, so I can pull the photograph off on the fabric. Cool. Stiffen it with duck cloth or canvas on the back. And then I take my sewing machine and drop the feed dogs, which are the little teeth that move the mm -hmm. fabric and use a darning foot which has less pressure and stitch over the photograph. Now, you can't really tell what's stitched here, but if you look at the back, you can see where the bobbin threads right. coming through. Mm -hmm. And I'll stitch until I cover the entire photograph. Oh, wow. And you can look at the back to see the, 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 the bobbin threads on the back. Bobbin threads are black and white. Okay. But the colors on the front are hundreds. When they have a sale on thread, I go in there and one of every color. And then the checkout gals are not Press their happy. eyes and say, oh gosh, Joanne's back. <laughs> and then what? how do you finish or present that piece? Do you frame it? Do you turn it into a bag? 
Yes, I I have this. Uh, it's uh, backed with a piece of craft interfacing, like you would use in a in a tote bag or a visor. Mm -hmm. Give it a little push out depth from the back. It's stitched to a piece of black. It's it's kind of a fake suede fabric, and then that's laced around a uh, acid free uh, foam core and put into uh, a shadow box frame. Are we in your studio right now, Joanne? Um, my studio is actually the next room over. Okay. This, this is my husband's half of the building in our backyard. I, actually, he, it's not half. He just gets a little bit. <laughs> kind of like my husband's in my shoe closet, right? But I'll show you what he keeps in his half. Oh. Is he a taxidermist or, uh, or not? <laughs> he, he's a hunter. Okay. Well, thank you, Joanne. I appreciate that. And whoops, I appreciate that. And with that, I would love to, uh, if I may, indulge myself in some of the questions I have of each of you all. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Thank you for showing. I, I'm intrigued by how many times you must have to reset the thread. Um, what I would do is I start with the very darks and the very lights and finish with the medium colors because it blends better. But, but yes, I'm constantly changing colors. And, and what I kind often of machine have, are you? Sorry, go ahead. It's an old, it's an old Bernina. It's not one of the programmed fancy new machines, um, which I also use for things, but mostly for my grandchildren's uh, clothing. It's just straight stitching. Uh, but as I said, if you drop the feed dogs, if you use a darning foot, the fabric does not move. So you draw by moving the fabric. It's just like drawing with a pencil, but instead of moving the pencil, you move the paper. I'm going to let you say it's just like that. I can draw pretty well with a pencil and paper, but I'm intimidated by every sewing machine. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I would love to ask some of the questions that I've come up with, as well as some of that are coming in on the chat. First of all, David, seriously, that was a fantastic video. You look like you've been on TV for a long time. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Well, go with it. So can I just ask a clarifying question, please? I understood yeah. the paper that you used, but are you hand cutting that or is it laser cutting? No, it's all hand cut. It's all hand That's... cut with an exacto knife. That yeah, is I would, remarkable. I would not know how to use a laser. <laughs> Thank One you. of the questions that came from the chat is how long does it take you to do some of your, your more complex pieces? Uh, the, uh, well, the alphabets uh, are probably the most complex uh, things I have. Uh, they take just a, even a couple hours just to research what I want to get on the alphabet. You know, I want to get, if I'm doing a music alphabet, I don't want to have all wind instruments or brass instruments. I want to get a variety. And uh, then trying to find uh, elements that start with a particular letter. Uh, sometimes those are sometimes on cues. For example, you have to stretch and find a, an element that most people don't know. So I put a key on the back of each. Uh, and then you have to design it so that everything touches. So it's one piece of paper when I cut it out. Right. Cutting often takes uh, 15 to 20 hours on an alphabet all like that. Uh, depending on how fine the elements are. And then gluing, which is the part that uh, is uh, sometimes the most uh, stressful, because uh, one bit of glue on the front and you kind of ruin the piece, uh, that can take an hour, an hour and a half to two hours as well. Do you protect the front somehow? Do you put some sort of a parchment or wax paper on the front and just no, I back don't. Once to turn it's glued it? down, once it's glued down, then I put a piece of glass and I mean, this, these all have uh, pieces of glass in, in front of them. So what are you using to hold the, the paper, the cut paper, in order for you to, to put the glue on the back? Uh, well, I'm just, uh, I mean, the cut paper is, uh, I'm, I'm just holding the cut paper myself and applying glue with a special little, uh, you know, actually it's a small piece of cardboard that I use to dip a little bit of, uh, uh, tacky, uh, uh, you know, anti uh, or acid free tacky glue onto the piece of cardboard. And then I put that on the back of the uh, piece one segment at a time. Uh, and then I, you know, flatten that onto the, uh, the contrasting background. 
you find that your dexterity carries on into other parts of your life? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a self-taught artist. Uh, I uh, actually learned how to use the, uh, the X-Acto knife uh, as a uh, geographer. And when I was making maps, as a, you know, doing cartography, I would use the X-Acto knife to cut out little bits of zipatone in the old days when it wasn't uh, generated by a computer. And from that, I then applied those skills to uh, you know, my paper cutting. But you know, in terms of cutting up uh, things in the kitchen, uh, yeah, probably don't want me there with uh, my exacto knife. Got it. Well, last question for you, David. Tell me the research that would go into getting the proportions right. For example, I was looking at your trains, and those are very deliberate. They have to be exact, I guess, before you, and they have to make sense, right? If, you're, if your caboose was too long or your, your stack was too tall, it would throw the whole balance. Right, right. I mean, everything is, uh, I mean, that's why I draw it in the reverse on the back first, so I can get all the proportions uh, correct. Uh, and that's not, uh, I mean, the difficulty in drawing the things in the reverse is when I'm doing anything that has lettering or numbers and sure. I have to make sure that's correct and often before I start cutting I'll take that design and hold it up to a mirror so right. I'm sure I've got it correct. Okay but thank you. Uh, thank you're welcome. You. Barry when I, I, uh, I'm the executive director of McLean Project for the Arts which is one of the wonderful partner organizations of the McLean Community Center and so I come to that role bringing what is affectionately known in my team as the art of the spreadsheet. So I am not an artist. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I bring the business side of it. But that said, the one art class that I have taken is in ceramics. And I don't recognize any of the basics that I learned in the, in the very advanced processes that, that you have. And I would love for you to spend a little bit of time talking about the processes. That's clearly not thrown on a wheel, right? You're doing a very, very different process. That's correct. I do what's called cast ceramics. And basically there's liquid clay, which is referred to as slip. Okay. And you have a, you have a mold mm -hmm. and you pour the slip into the mold and you have bands around it and you allow it to set up for a period of time. And then after it sets up, you pour the excess off and then you have to let it drain for quite a while sometime until the excess drains out. And then you flip it up and you um, allow it to dry. And then after it's set up for a while, you take the bands off, you separate the mold, and then you remove the piece from the mold. And what happens then is you remove the rough places where the mold comes together. It's called the, the, the mold marks. So right. The mold marks. And then you can uh, either do painting and underglazing, or you can fire it first, and then you can either glaze it or you can use acrylics. Uh, there's any number of things that you can do with it. Um, I've, I've, I have taken some pottery classes and, and about all I can say is I can center it on the wheel. <laughs> well, that's an accomplishment. That's an accomplishment. One of the things that I like very much about art is the problem solving, right? It's very much like the scientific method where you have a hypothesis, you experiment with it, you learn from it, you refine it, and you, and you repeat it. I can imagine that that applies to a lot of the processes that you've just described, and in particular, the shapes that you work with. Mm -hmm. right. What's been the hardest of the shapes? What's been the most oh, challenging goodness. to sort out? Um... I would have a hard time saying that there was a harder one in particular. I, I would think it would depend on the detail of the mold. Some molds may have three or four or five pieces. Let's say you have a, let's say you have a mold with um, arms for a figurine, pouring those separately and then attaching them Attach in a way that it looks natural. Let's say you have a figurine and it has arms and maybe it's riding a horse or something. Uh, all of that would be poured in a mold and then basically you would have to put it together um, in the correct order to make it look right. Well, thank you so much for sharing there. Just enchanting, really are. Thank you. I have, before Brenda, I'm gonna, we're gonna come to you in just a second, but there's a question that's come in the chat for you, David. 
where did it just go? Oh, David, some of your pieces have sold. Can you be, can you recreate those or are you gonna be refreshing inventory on the site? Yes, uh, I mean, anything that I've done, as long as I, uh, I mean, anything I've done, I can recreate. But when I recreate it, I will change some of the elements a bit uh, just to make sure each piece is unique. Like when I'm doing an alphabet, uh, the mammal alphabet, I've uh, done uh, four different versions of that. And oh, you wow. know, sometimes I'll use a quoll for the cue, sometimes a quokka. Uh, you can look both of these up in your dictionary <laughs> uh, and, and that sort of thing. I'll just change a few elements or a few different uh, little pieces to make it unique, but they can oh, be recreated. Great. Yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And then you'll be reloading the website or shall people just email you off the website? Yes. If people are interested, they can uh, contact me through the website. Great. And I bet that's the same for all of you. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, great. So Brenda, soap making, third generation soap making? Yes, yes. Um, I grew up in a small town in Illinois and um, I grew up on a farm. And um, my, my mother, my, my grandmother and my mo mother used to get together. They'd come out to our house and they would make soap. But I was never allowed to be in the kitchen. They'd always tell me I had to leave. Because and, of the lie. Yeah, because of the lie, yeah. It, it, so lie I've, I've read about mostly in old time stories when People are scrubbing and how it really does burn your hands. How does lye trans transform from being something that burns you to being something that is healing in the, in the products that you've built? Yeah, it's fascinating, right? So that's the process of um, when you mix lye, you know, first you dissolve the lye, comes in crystals in water. And then when you mix it with the oils, it goes through a, a process called saponification. That's and what you mentioned. It's okay. a chemical process where the fatty acids um, combine with the, um, the lye and then it creates, um, it creates the soap. The soap. And how have you done the research on the various oils that you're choosing? Oh, there's, so, there's a lot of books. I've done a lot of research in, in books. And then I, um, I also research online and find out a lot of information that way. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite of the scents? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about the favorites. And so I was like looking behind me, like, what would I say is my favorites? I don't really have a favorite. I do like a lot of people love lavender. I kind of like them all. Like, you know, so um, well, I was awfully glad to hear you. Scents, I can tell you the scent I don't like. There's a scent. Um, it's a, it's a, a little flower from China. It's called Yang Lang Lang. Yang Lang. Yeah. I do not like that scent. And so I, um, I, I don't, I have a lot of that essential oil and I tend not to use it, but there was, there are people that said, oh, I love this. I love it in my bathroom. It just scents the whole room. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. No. So I will confess as I have watched through craft, the, the McLean Holiday Art and Crafts Festival, but it, others as well, I'm enchanted by the soap, but I honestly, a bit, a bit intimidated. Do I just use that in the shower or is there, is that special hand-washing soap that you leave at the, the guest room sink and it looks pretty? I mean, is so that something I, that you enjoy using all the time? I use it all the time. I have a friend that I uh, go over to her house and she loves to put my soaps in her guest bathroom, but mm -hmm. I use it just in the shower all the time because um, I tended to have, my son and I both have tended to have a little bit of um, dry skin issues. Sure. So uh, I was always searching for um, our pediatrician gave me lotions to buy and none of it really seemed to help very much. And so then when I, I bought um, on, on vacation, I bought a, a bar of a goat milk soap and I was like, wow, this is really nice. And yeah. the creaminess and the lather and um, it seemed to help my skin. And so then I said, I'm going to, you know, my mom and grandma used to do this. Why, why don't I make my own? So I, I used to do that. Yeah. So my last question out of watching your wonderful video is the technique. I'm intrigued by, are they, uh, are you doing them in pans, like a baking pan, if you will, and then cutting them afterwards? Or do you have individual molds? I have, uh, most of them are loaf molds. Like if you would think of a banana bread loaf, they're long and narrow molds. Some of them are wider and some of them are skinnier. So like you can tell the difference, this one skinnier than that one. Right. And how are you putting the colors in such that they, do you have to do those in each individual layers and let it dry? Um, yeah, so some of the soaps are um, very time intensive because you have to create one color and then you add the next color. And 
some of the other soaps you have to be very fast. So some some of them like um, the crayon box one where it has all the different colors. I actually have um, little funnel pictures and you have to make, I think that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That one's seven colors and you have, I have each picture, each little funnel measuring cup is the best way to, explain, to describe it. Each one has its own color. So you mix all the colors and you put the scent in last because sometimes the scent can make the, um, the soap accelerate. And so then you have okay. to make it fast. Is the, um, are these techniques ones that you you saw your grandmother and mother using or did they put the heart of it in you and you've been experimenting with all these different techniques? Um, no, my mom, my mother and my grandmother made soap because you know, it was more- You're on the farm and- Militarian, like they would make the soap and their soap was just plain, plain color, no colors, no scents. And I had asked my mom for the recipe and she said, you don't want my recipe. And I'm like, I do. And it was, then I, I got it and I laughed because it was just basically water, lye and oil. I'm like, oh, okay, that's just- Okay, maybe I don't. But they used maybe. to use it mostly for laundry. Um, it was a more, a stronger kind of soap. Sure. So it was used for um, getting stains out of, out of sure. grass stains and mud. And My family uh, grew up in, on farms in Washington state and I'm yeah. the first generation to be on the East Coast and I have all these wonderful laundry boards that, right. that on the farms that, that that's exactly what uh, my yeah, grandparents exactly. used as well. Exactly, little scrub boards, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And well, I think my biggest accomplishment today is keeping us on schedule, which is kind of remarkable because I could speak with each of you all for a long, long time. Is there anything that each, uh, any of you would like to close with before we wrap up? No? I'm just excited to have been part of this. This is my first year in McLean and this is my first virtual show. And I thought this was a lot of fun. And I was fascinated by everybody's videos. The videos again were fantastic and I would like to close. That's a great, great segue, Brenda, for me to thank again and to recognize all the hard work that Catherine Nesbitt and her team did to decide firstly that this, the show was going to go on and secondly, to figure out how to do it. And compliments go all around Fairfax County. In order to put on something like this, you need to go through a procurement process and find the production studios, which has been a fantastic group to work with. You need to work with your entire board and leadership committee, your leadership team. So to each of the artists who are participating, to Catherine and your team, to George Sachs and the McLean Community Center Board, thank you. And thank you for including me in this. It's really been a wonderful afternoon. Best wishes. And let me call everybody's attention one more time to the opportunity to visit each of these artists on the site the McLean Center site, and you will find each of their links and go and enjoy and explore. Thank you so much. And we hope you'll tune back in tomorrow.